perspectives, different views, one voice. Welcome to the LDM Perspective. Thank you for joining us for our latest episode and thank you our listeners for the continuous support. Um, obviously, during this quarantine period, I know that a lot of people have been finding new things to do. So some people are learning how to cook, reading a book, learning a new language. I also know that a lot of people are spending their time watching a lot of kind of streaming media sites, uh, one in particular Netflix. And this conversation is just around something that we kind of found on Netflix, which we found quite interesting. Um, there's a documentary. There's a documentary about Malcolm X called "Who Killed Malcolm X," I believe. And really, maybe the genesis of why we want to have this conversation. So, really, in regards to our transcripts, when you actually go to our podcast and you read up about what we're all about, one of the key things that we've said on there, the quote that we've taken from Malcolm X is a quote that we've taken from Malcolm X says we must liberate our minds by any means necessary so the whole idea of the podcast is for us to learn and keep learning and try to you know liberate our minds with our audience and people that listen to us so it just felt right that at this point we needed to, to actually talk about one of the people that actually has inspired us to have this um, podcast in the first place and um, so yeah this documentary is called who killed Malcolm X and I believe no, I believe. I know that my co-host, um, actually, I didn't even say my name. Yes, um, and I am Kojo, and today I'm with my co-host. Mo. Cam. Ali. Yes, and this is something that we've all kind of watched. So at some point, I'll just throw it out there just to see what the general gist of it is. Um, but yeah, guys, from watching the documentary, first of all, what did you guys think of this documentary? And why do you guys feel felt like it would be a good conversation to have with our audience on this? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll be honest, me watching it kind of reignited my love for Malcolm X. Um, he's definitely a person that I grew up really um, admiring as an idol as well. And in terms of his kind of attitude to take things into your own hands and do for yourself and not expect others to do for you. Um, so yeah, I was, I was, I really, I really, what really got me was the title was Who Killed Malcolm X? Because I'll be honest with you, it's something I never really looked into as much as I loved the, the man and everything that he's done. Even I never kind of focused on it or actually looked into it, which um, was kind of a shame for on my part, but then also a curiosity in terms of how this is going to progress. Mm, interesting point. And uh, what about yourself, Ali? Oh, for me, to be frank, it's very depressing. And um, it's um, as what Moe just tapped into is the very depressing and, de- and a shame because uh, I don't know anything I've read. And even funny enough, um, history time, there's not too much that is being taught in school. They don't go in deep, in depth about it. And just in years now down the line, they wanted to popularize it and allow the, the, the whole world to know exactly what's going on. And it's just appalling and a shame how, how it's all crumble and, and how what has happened. And till now, I'm still biting my tongue to understand the, the whole scene of it and himself as a, as a hero. That's the way I would see him. He's definitely as a hero. And, and for that fact that he has opened the the black community or or people of color, you know, giving them opportunity to now, which is the benefit that we are we we're, we're reaping. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's what I feel about it. Thanks for that, Ali. Come yourself. Yeah, I think for me, um, I was certainly drawn to it from the title alone, um, "Who Killed Malcolm X," because I was aware. Um, people have been convicted for his murder. But I think that the title alone just sort of, um, you know, opened the fact up that, okay, this guy's about to unravel possibly a host of conspiracies because obviously we know someone was convicted or people were convicted for his murder. And the very fact that it was titled Who Killed Malcolm X just made me know, okay, this, this is possibly the, 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 
point where someone gets to unravel possibly someone who's pulling the strings behind um, those people that committed um, the murder. Yeah, no, definitely. I think for myself, I saw the title definitely was something that kind of caught my attention. And just like what Mo said, it's always been someone that you revere and stuff, but I've never really looked at the actual story around his killing. I always thought it's just one of these things, I don't know, um, conspiracy, someone's killed him, but I've never really delved into it. So it was interesting actually watching it. So I must say, obviously going through it, there was a few things that I kind of got from it. The whole idea of the police involvement, the police and the FBI involvement, actually finding out about the killer or the alleged killer. Also, there was some Pan-African, Pan-Africanism movement and the whole New York state and the whole how they kind of felt or how their tensions were around the alleged killer and how generally they kind of felt about Malcolm X. But just before we delve into this whole kind of the, the series, I wonder what, what makes Malcolm X such a role model or someone that you see as the hero? I know Ali mentioned everything as a hero. What makes him, what makes you guys look to him as someone to be held in that regard, um, I'll say? And maybe we could start this from Ali. Um, it's like, it's like, how do I put it? It's, it's the work that he has done and the fact that he has given the truth. And the truth, obviously, as, you all, as we all know, is really um, it's a matter of way. It's a matter of ways that it's either you're going to lose your life or there are going to be consequences. And he has taken that on, his, on himself to go through that, to that, go through that length. And obviously, within those periods of time, black people or people of color was not in the right state of mind. So the, the word hero, for me, is like, it's, power, it's a powerful word to express. And as I mentioned, because of him, people of color today are happier. Oh, we are still going through the situation. I mean, but not as severe as it was back then. So that's why I mentioned the word hero, because I look up to him and he, he inspired me, especially watching the, the, the episode. He has inspired me to the max that when you stand for something, no matter what, go for it. Regardless of, um, regardless of your environment, regardless of who, who it is or anything, stand by it and make sure you're firm because at the end of the day it is the right thing you don't you can't lie about what is not the right thing and yeah I, that's why i use the word he's a hero because i wanna i wanna as a man i wanna stand by what i believe is right and visually if i see something or i know something and i know it's going to benefit a lot of millions of people or thousands of, of people why not be honest what can the only worst can be is just that the consequences on my side, which is I'll be either be killed or something goes wrong with me. But as long as at the end of the day, as long as I stand by it and it's the right thing. So yeah, I believe that. Yeah, anyone else to add? Yeah, um, for me, I think what drew me, what draws me to Malcolm X really is a lot of the rhetoric that a lot of the stuff he would speak about, you know, uh, when he joined the Nation of Islam, especially where he was talking, especially he, he was around at a time when black people were demonized. Um, they, they, they were suffering the after effects of just being sort of, you know, of like slavery being abolished, but they, they you know, they, that effect had still filtered down to that particular generation. And, and, and I think he just, I think the way he spoke about just like black people standing up for themselves, um, especially in terms of like self-defense towards like um, those institutions that were like you know institutionally racial, like, racial towards um, black people. I think that for me that was a massive thing, and that was certainly like inspirational to hear at that time because he was speaking at a time where you know it took a lot of courage to say half the things that he was saying because it you know could quite easily you know at, to some degree you know you could even say the way he was speaking is what got him killed. But even even so, prior to that, with a lot of what he was saying, it was very courageous because it was easily stuff that could have gotten him killed. But 
I think he was a man that had a lot of integrity. And so he, he was someone that, on one hand, wasn't going to be control, controlled by people and wasn't someone that was going to bite his tongue. Um, I think even going further than that, I think his transformation when he went to prison from um, his life of crime to when he educated himself to, to become like, you know, a good orator. I think this, this is a man who's got wonderful oratory skills and these are skills that he picked up in prison. You know, this is a man who said when he went to prison, he was illiterate. He could barely read or write and barely even knew certain words in the dictionary. He said he had to study the dictionary from A to Z. And, and as a result of that, he developed a love for reading. And it's from that love for reading that he developed, you know, the oratory skills that he had. And what he also did is that he, he made you realize that one of the most powerful things in this world or one of the things that people fear in this world is the educated black man. That's what he showed to me. Educated black man is a powerful tool. Perspectives, different views, one voice. voice. Educated black man, because prior to that, he was committing crimes, he was doing offences, and he was just considered what, you know, whatever you want to call it, a pawn in society. But I think as soon as he educated himself and was released from prison, tables had turned and there was a complete shift. And it's like, you could see how dangerous he was to... The, the authorities in America, to other groups as well. And they just saw, you know, the level of power that he had amassed in terms of um, trying to push his rhetoric or his agenda forward. And, and I can certainly say that, that that certainly impressed me. What, did you know how long he was in prison for? And what inspired him to... I believe it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was 10 years. Yeah, he served seven for burglary, I believe. Okay, all right. Okay, yes, more so in, oh, sorry, go on. No, no, so I was saying he, he was in there a significant amount of time. And I guess what he did is he, he put that time to good use. I mean, some people go, in, you know, you could go inside and you, you could <laughs> they, get to that point where you could put... They do weights, in it? They come out tank, man. That's what most people do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, he, he, he used that time to sort of, to, 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 to work on himself, to better himself. And as I said, he just like, like I said, he became what we call, you know, I think one of the one, one of the things society fears the most is the educated black man, and that's where he became. More yourself, what you found, uh, why, why this guy, this man is so revered, or how you see this man as a role model, and why? Yeah, no, I think Malcolm X is absolutely amazing, mate. Top notch, top geezer, flipping superb. Um, yeah, no, do you know what it is? It's, it's, it's mainly all about how he was unapologetic in the truth. And I think white America, black America, a lot of people just weren't ready for how truthful this guy was. And sometimes it, hit, sometimes it rubbed off people in a wrong way, some in a bad way, some in a good way, but it was the truth. And even when we went on all these talk shows and you see him speak, and he would the way he was so articulate and the charisma and how he spoke, a lot of people just couldn't really refute what he was saying. As 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 as, as truthful as it was, as hard as it was, no one could ever really come back at him. And I just thought it was just great to see, great to watch, great to read. And yeah, that's that's for me, in in, in including what everyone here has said so far. That's just the added touch for me that kind of made me really, really, really appreciate him. No, thanks, Mo. I think I think definitely I echo a lot of the stuff that you guys are saying. For me, just purely, it's just about a man being a man and, you know, just saying stuff and sticking by it. I think we've had conversations before about being brave when everyone is saying yes, being that only one in the room to say no, and I felt like he did that. And I think that in regards to what his aim was, I know there was one quote that he said, a man who believes in freedom will do anything under the sun to acquire or preserve his freedom. And I feel like he stuck by that. He actually gave his life for the freedom and how authentic he was. Even as per the um, series, how, how he showed how authentic this person was. And to be able to be that true to yourself, to first of all, follow the words of um, Elijah, um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the teachings of the Nation of Islam, follow that to a T, you know, not even getting married or abs, abs, ab, abstinence from sex till he got married and all these kind of stuff. 
he really was someone to be really like just someone to actually look 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 up to, I should say. But then it's interesting one thing that you said, Mo, just to kind of bring the conversation along with it. You said that what you loved about him was the truth and how that robbed people, robbed off people the wrong way, or how the truth kind of was translated and other people kind of it kind of the truth kind of upset people. So I just like would like to just start on that conversation there. Because from the series that we kind of watch, we know there was one truth that he kind of kind of said that kind of really kind of set the motion um to to his killing or is believed that that was what kind of led to all the activities that happened around his killing. Does anyone like to kind of um, broaden that a bit? I think for myself, I'm looking at the whole GF Kennedy killing and what he kind of said around that. Would you guys agree? Or would you guys want to add anything different to that? Yeah, the JFK one, that one had me have a little chuckle, you know, had a little laugh when, he, when I heard him say that. Can you actually call exactly what he said there in that GFK kind of thing? Oh, uh, you, you know, I can't quote exactly, but I know what he said is... He says it's a case of the chickens coming home to roost. Yeah, they asked this him about... This is after the killing of JFK. Uh, yeah. Go on, go on more. Yeah. yeah, they asked him about the JFK killing and he, and he basically said that this is a clear example of the chickens coming home to roost. Um, basically, you have a president that was putting out a lot of violence in a lot of their foreign policies and what they do and now that violence has come back onto him. Was he was GFK involved in Vietnam at all or did he No, nah, that wasn't him. I don't think I don't think he was his, I don't think he was talking about JFK specifically. I think he's talking about the history of America. America in the yeah. yeah. America, yeah, he said America saw projected violence onto other places and the very fact that one of their own who, who's the head of state was killed is basically, you know, that violence coming back to home them. Yeah, so you know the truth, which is fair enough regarding the truth and how it robs of people the wrong way. But GFK was kind of loved, really, and especially around how he passed, though. Should he have been a bit more, I don't know, yeah, sensitive around that subject in the first place? Or what do you guys think? I reckon he should have been, but I like that he wasn't. But well, the truth is the truth, though. That's what it is. Yeah. And, and, and I guess just adding to that in regards to his relationship in the Nation of Islam, um, prior to that conference, he was already told not to talk about J.F. Kennedy because um, the Honourable Elijah Muhammad already came up to kind of give his kind of um, condolences and stuff like that. Um, so it felt, would you guys not say that, yes, that was the truth, but then it's, it's, it's almost like it was felt as if he was questioning the Honourable Elijah Muhammad's authority as well within the nation of Islam, him going out there to say something like that? Oh yeah, I mean if, he's, if, he, if, if they've had a conversation and he's been advised not to say anything then yeah, it's certainly a case of going against his authority. That, that's clear, that's, that's clear cut. I, don't, I can't see how you can see it any other way. Um, but I think, I guess that's just the type of person Malcolm X was. You know, he just was, he just, if he felt the need to say something and in fact, I mean, when he said it, he was responding to a question. Yeah, I don't think he actively went out to try and make a comment about or negative comment towards JFK, JFK's murder or anything like that. Or even JFK as a president in particular. He just, he was asked a question and he answered it. No, that, that's true. Uh, yeah, go on, sorry, Mo, if you want to come in. Yeah, no, I think it's one of them things whereby um, you kind of see the difference in experience. So the Honourable Elijah Muhammad, he had experience in terms of politics and, you know, how things work and blah, blah, blah. So he could see already the backlash of what that comment would do because of um, how much um, Kennedy was loved. But then I kind of like um, what you, you could say Malcolm Max's innocence in terms of he wasn't completely under, unaware of how things work and what would happen and he just told the truth straight up like that's how he felt that um what would you say there was a bit of naivety in that then no definitely there was there definitely was yeah, Ali, yeah but i kind of i kind of disagree of with the comment that you just mentioned you raised up uh, more because you're saying that how um honorable elijah muhammad 
knew about politics. So because of that, it's kind of already given Marco Max um, a sense of understanding not to tap into something like that. I don't think it was. From my understanding, Muhammad, um, Elijah, uh, Elijah Muhammad, he only knew about, he, his understanding is more about religion. And the differences between him and Malcolm X, Malcolm X is more politician. So he knew how to trigger whoever his environment is. And the fact that he's very intelligent and he has that, 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 that understanding of himself, he knew exactly what he was doing. So it's not about whether or not he wasn't informed or he was informed as a, as a man, as a man that, that like to making sure that he tells the truth. He doesn't like to be controlled by anyone for that means. And especially what is killing it as well, especially that he knows what Elijah Muhammad is doing behind back door. That's what really even make him more upset at the fact that people around him and he's supposed to be the after God, he's supposed to be the, the main God for, for the humanity, um, um, the, the human race, the Islamic, and then he's doing disgusting thing. So he doesn't, as a as a true man and as a true believer, he does not he does not condemn that. He doesn't he doesn't accept that. So for that reason, he's gonna go and reach out and making sure the public are aware of what is happening. And for you to mention that politician, I don't think that he understood about politician to that to that to that. He, if he knew because Mark Menda of what he needed to do. And prior to what, obviously, that's what made him get to where he is at the moment, you know? That's what I think anyway. No, I, I think, I know what you're saying, Ali, but I know at that time when Malcolm X made that speech, he wasn't fully aware of what the Elijah Muhammad had done or the, the allegations around him in terms of um, the, the, the women and all of that stuff. At that time, he was fully loyal to the Elijah Muhammad. Um, so in, in terms of Malcolm X speaking, from, from my understanding, it was just purely he said what he felt. It wasn't um, a political approach or anything like that. But Elijah Muhammad has been around for years, built businesses, whatever, gained public opinion, grown everything. Trust me, he, there's no way he could have survived that long and done, achieved all that he'd done if he did not know how to maneuver around general public and politics. Yeah, yeah, I'm not dispute. I'm not disputing that in 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 high sense. I'm not disputing that. But what I'm trying to say, whether he has been around for a long time, we just need to understand that uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he knew his agenda, what he wanted to get into, right? And whether or not he's discussed it, he's discussed the situation with Malcolm X. That was not the main focus. Whether or not Malcolm X didn't didn't was serving him giving him very um was loyal to him within that period of time he didn't know anything but the fact that what i'm trying to say is that malcolm x was not a person that's going to be controlled hence why he innocently spoke up and said the truth to what as much as he can believe um as much as possible for him to do that's what it is that's what i think that now i understand that but i guess i guess then this goes into because this is just building up about all these things that happen around this whole death and the animosity in the nation of Islam. So if you're saying that, then a lot of the rhetoric that we were hearing in the documentary to say that people within the nation of Islam felt like Malcolm X, felt like he was too big for um, Honorable um, Elijah Muhammad, then that's really correct because you can't be, you can't be like he went into the nation of Islam because of Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he was meant to be loyal to Honorable Elijah Muhammad because you've already had a conversation and I've told you, regardless whatever happens, it initially, um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that he didn't even, even want that conference to go ahead in the first place. And Malcolm X kept on saying to him, no, don't worry, I'm not going to mention anything, don't worry, don't worry. And that's when he got the go ahead. So if we're saying that he's someone that's not going to be controlled, then is it then fair down to say that in regards to a lot of the stuff that the Nation of Islam, a lot of the commentary coming from there, is that this guy felt like he was bigger than the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Is that fair to say then, if we're going to base it to say that he can't be controlled by anyone? No, I, I, I don't think it's... Um, I, I, I think 
the general build up in terms of the nation turning against Malcolm X, I think was more to do with jealousy in terms of how much he was growing, how big he was getting. And that was purely because of how articulate and well-spoken and how and charismatic and how he carried himself. And also the fact that he was always on the front lines. He would be out there on the front lines, talking, speaking. If something happened, he would be there. He, there was that vision and that presence. Well, that's correct, and, yeah. That's correct. But you need to understand this, yeah. In an army or in any kind of organization, whatever is said from the top is what people follow. If you're going to be someone within that unit, and the man from the top is saying certain stuff and you're not following, then it can be seen by others that you feel like you're bigger, regardless of how you want to put it. So yes, um, the jealousy and stuff, I'm not disputing that. But I'm just talking about that one incident and how that one incident escalated everything. Because we are quite aware yep. after that he was put under, I, can't, I don't know, he was re- relief of his position for nine Administrative years. leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, but I... I, 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 I emo, but is there not something to say, look, literally, he's the head, he said something, why didn't you follow? You didn't follow because you want the press, you want to have everything. And that's fair to say that, isn't it? No, I kind of I kind of disagree because um, you use a, a theory with um, um, uh, military. You're saying that when how how you're going in the army, you you got information from the top and you must follow. But when you're doing that, what right, what usually happens? You that follow and give the instructions. I mean, you've been given instructions. When you're in the military, you're the person that end up hurting yourself or get killed. So why would I put my 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 myself in the front line? I I will for the order. There's certain orders that I will follow, and then certain order that I don't make no sense. I won't go and follow because and I'm not going to put myself in the front line. I might die first thing in a war. I will say why join the military. Say that again. I will say to you why join the military. Why no, would you put no, yourself? No, no. Understand, understand this. Understand. Yeah, but. Yeah? For of the nation of Islam, where everyone knows the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the head of the nation yeah. of Islam, and whatever he says goes, and his followers, what did he call them? His, um, what did he call them? They, were, they had heads in different kind of centers. But anyway, his followers were meant to actually listen to the word of Honorable um, Elijah Muhammad. So we can on one hand say that I'm going to be part of this, but I'm only going to take the bit that I like and use that. And on the other hand, say that, oh, I'm just, it doesn't, for me, that doesn't really sit right, in honesty. It's just based on that, that um, idea alone. I don't know if I'm the only one that thinks like that, but I don't feel like you should put yourself in a position if your morals are going to be conflicted. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I reckon he was wrong for disobeying Elijah Muhammad, but I don't feel it was enough for everybody to turn against him for that. So you don't feel like that it was right for people to feel like, he felt like he was bigger than Elijah Muhammad because he wasn't following them. Because if I, if I was a standby in the nation of Islam and this happened, I'll be looking at that thinking, oh, how can this guy not follow what was said? He was told clearly not to think. So why does he think that it was right for him to talk about that? Don't you think it's fair for people to think like that at that time? Well, yeah, but yeah, I, think, yeah, but I, I, I don't think he's bigger. I don't think he's bigger. I, I, think, I think that's when nostalgia kicks in. He's been serving them for 12 years, following them, and then the one time he doesn't, Oh, now he doesn't. Do you get what I mean? Oh, bro, it was a big deal, bro. Man, I understand that, but it was a big deal. But anyway, let's move forward a bit, yeah? Um, so that conversation kind of happened. As you said, he was placed under what again? In something leave for 90 days? Suspension. Suspension. He was suspended. He was suspended, yeah. suspended from all practices. For 90 days. And just pushing it forward a bit. So during that time is when he was trying to end, yeah, actually, in the nation of Islam, I think, a lot of the, um, it, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad start, started to delegate um, a lot of the kind of activities to different people. I know there's one person called John Ali. I think that was his name. Um, apparently, he was, he was an FBI informant. And in the actual series, he was the one that was being interviewed in the restaurant, if you remember the Indian restaurant, the guy that was being interviewed in the Indian restaurant. You guys yeah, know? I remember him. He kept yeah. touching his image. And from mm-hmm. some other um, um, things that I've kind of read, it was said that that was the guy that was creating the bigger rift between the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. So anyway, so fast forward a bit. When he was on leave, we are aware that he was trying to write a lot of letters of reconciliation to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to say that, you know, 
if he's let out again or if he's let out for public speaking, he's, he's definitely going to follow up, follow everything that was being said and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think I've, I've missed it a bit, but when did he, in those 90 day period, what actually happened for him to start the conversations that Ali was talking about before when he started finding out all these things about the Honourable Elijah Muhammad then? What kind of, what happened? Did something happen or it just happened that he just started start finding out about this information, which he then kind of started talking about it? Is there something in between? That was a question, really. Was he contacted by one of the um, women? Yeah, yeah, that's was he, right. Yeah. Was. He, Malcolm X was contacted by one of the women. Yeah. I believe he was. Okay. Yeah, no, he was. He was. Okay, so he was contacted by one of the women. That's when he started finding out all these, I think, five or six women that, five women in their documentary said, five or more, that the Honourable Elijah Muhammad had been having some sort of sexual encounter with, affair with, yeah. I should say, and then he had children with some of them. And also, yeah. I think one, one fundamental point about how authentic this person was is that on his leave is when the FBI kind of approached him to be a snitch, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. kind of recorded. And it was interesting, yeah. even during that time, how he was very adamant that, look, I'm not the person that you need to be talking to and I don't want anything to do with this, which kind of just gave me that kind of thing that, wow, this guy was really kind of really genuine because we know in the Nation of Islam there were so many FBI informants and police informants in there. So fast forward a bit. He started talking about this whole Elijah Muhammad and the affairs that Elijah Muhammad was having. Do you think at that point, do you guys think that if he was let back, if the leave was kind of um, leave suspended, it doesn't make any sense. I know he was suspended, but if that leave was kind of like removed where he could go back to public speaking and stuff like that, do you think he would have taken the stance that he took regarding some of the stuff that he found out about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? It's a good I don't, question. I don't think so. I don't think so. Because what happened oh, is, sorry, Mo, what, what triggered say? it is that... Sorry, 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 Ali, not to cut you. Mo, did you say something? No, I said this, that's a good it's question. a good question. Oh, yeah, go on, Ali, sorry. Yeah, so what triggered it is not the 90 days. It's the fact that, with, I mean, within the period of the 90 days, what triggered the situation, obviously, first of all, he got information as what came with waste. From, from one of the ladies, but what, cause, what made the, the, the situation even more, um, um, more worse is that uh, Muhammad Ali, I'm not sure everyone knows the boxer Muhammad Ali, so he was with Muhammad Ali within that period, those 90 days. Muhammad Ali won his first uh, match, what made him a superstar or heavy, heavyweight um, champion. So then what he did next, he took him himself and Muhammad Ali went to Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And obviously within that time, within those two period of time, um, um, Honorable Elijah Muhammad renamed, um, cause it was, his name was Cass, Cassie, Cassie. Can someone give me Cassius Cassius Muhammad is, um, Ali new, um, proper name? Yeah, Cassius Clay. Oh, yeah, exactly. So when can we when, for one second, sorry, sorry, Cass, I'm Cassius really Clay, right? Okay. Then what happened? Um, when Mohammed, I mean Malcolm X, took um, Cass, Cassia, Cassia Clay, is it Cassia Clay? Cassius Clay. Cass, Cassius Clay. When he took him to um, Honorable um, Elijah Muhammad, he renamed. He gave him a new name, which was um, Muhammad Ali. So then, when he done, when he has done that. Malcolm X realized that there was something much deeper because Malcolm X's name was not changed. Honorable um, Elijah Muhammad didn't change his name. So that means there's something significant more that is happening. Then obviously, as a very intelligent man, he realized there's something not right. So then, yeah, that's what triggered it. That's what, from my understanding, I think that's what triggered the situation, that when he was suspended for 90 days. Um... I must say, I think the whole cash is clear element. I know that, and I'm not sure whether that was during the year, because yeah, you are right in the sense that he didn't physically take um, Cassius Clay to and to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but he brought Cassius Clay 
to to Islam because he was very interested in that and they kind of had a friendship. So he thought because of that friendship and bringing Cassius Clay um, closer to the nation of Islam, when he did when he did actually kind of go and meet the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad will recognize that it was Malcolm X that did all that groundwork to get Muhammad Ali to become part of the nation of Islam. That's how I understood of it. And when that didn't happen, um, that's when, as in he was expecting that to happen and that didn't happen and he was a bit um, pissed off about that. But I guess the question even with that is that even when that did happen with that whole cast in, in Muhammad Ali, if at that point Malcolm X was allowed to go to public speaking and all that kind of stuff, do you think he would have started talking about the affairs and stuff that the Honorable Muhammad was kind of having? That, that's the question I'm just trying to say. I'm just trying to say here that I feel like when he felt like he was never going to come out of their kind of imposed 90 days or whatever that kind of thing was, and I didn't think it was 90 days anyway, it was going to go on for um, indefinitely, something like along those lines, where he kind of realized that is when he kind of started I don't know if you want to call it switching or whatever not, but I'm just asking a question. What do you guys think? Do you guys think that if he was if he was let out or his leave was kind of relieved, he would have kind of started having those rhetorics against the uh, Honourable Elijah Muhammad? I think he probably still would have, because he looked at Elijah Muhammad as a pious being, pious person, in terms of he had a strict moral code, um, strict ethical code. As far as he was concerned, he, Malcolm X himself, adhered to that code. And as far as he was concerned, this is the man that he was following. And this is a man that, as far as he's concerned, will, should you know, lead by example. So to hear all of that information you know, about this man having you know, relationships with a lot of these 16 and 17 year olds and then father and children with them, I still think he certainly would have spoken out. Just on the, just on the principle of that, of their belief yeah. and their faith and stuff, yeah? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Mo, what do you think? You know what? For me, I actually think that he wouldn't have said anything. And the reason why I say that is because from all the reading and, and research I've done on him, he didn't actually start speaking out about um, Elijah Muhammad until later, later down the line. So he had known a lot of the stuff that he'd done and still didn't say nothing. It was only until, um, this is way after he went to Mecca, after he set up um, his own Pan-African group, everything. This is literally when the last few days, literally the last few um, months, basically before he was killed, when he was being kicked out of his home, him and his family were being kicked out of his home by the Nation of Islam, where he'd lived for 11 years, and he had to try and take them to court to try and keep the house. And it was only after his frustration, after all that treatment by the Nation of Islam, did he then start coming out about his stuff. So I do feel if he did join back, I doubt he would have said much, purely because even he knows how much the Elijah Muhammad was loved in his whole congregation and group. And him coming out with anything like that definitely just would have put more knives in his back and tar made him more of a target. Because then you're saying that if he did go back, um, even ostracize himself, even within the group. Yeah, that's and right. Yeah, on the outside. That's interesting. Bomo, Bomo, Bomo. You kind of uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you not kind of contradicting yourself? Because I did mention previously that Malcolm X knew everything within those years that he was serving Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and then you said no. So that means all this time he knew what was going on. He didn't say anything. Because he was provoked and obviously triggered the situation within that month that when he was going to be killed and obviously kicked out and in his house was, was, was bombed and all of that put on fire, was not the reason why he's starting to talk. But and he knew all of everything back in the day, back all then, he knew everything. Or oh, am I wrong to, to address that? No, I'm not saying he knew everything like from years before. I'm talking from the 90-day suspension. That's when one of the girls came to him. So he's known from that point up until the whole time of his house, um, um, the Nation of Islam trying to kick him out of the house. Up until that point, from the 90 days, 
to him being kicked out of the house, he's known and still hadn't said anything about what Elijah Muhammad had done. Well, he hadn't said anything publicly. Right, you're right, yeah. yeah. So let's move this on a bit. But I'm not too sure whether he started... I thought he started talking about the Honourable Elijah Muhammad, hence the reason why they wanted to start kicking him out of the house. Um, I thought that came before the... I didn't know that the kicking, them trying to kick him out of the house is what triggered him talking about it. I thought he already started talking about the Honourable Elijah Muhammad. That's one thing I'm not too sure about that comment there, because I think I feel that he started talking about that, hence the reason why they tried to kick him out. Um, so actually, just moving forward a bit. So we've spoken about the JFK incident. We've spoken about him being suspended for 90 days and him writing all these letters to Honorable Elijah Muhammad, which is believed I never actually got to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And then he's finding out information about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and what he was doing. Then the FBI and the police were trying to approach him to be a snitch and all that kind of stuff. So this become, became kind of a melting pot. And as more you've mentioned, he started doing a lot of work going into Mecca. He came back and he changed his name to El Shabazz. I can't, I can't remember, but I know he changed his name. Um, but then moving forward to the killing then. So just going um, over to the killing then. Um, I know it was in the autobahn where he was meant to be addressing um, I think it was an African Union kind of thing anyway, from the readings that I've kind of seen. It was an OAAU kind of meeting, um, I believe. And yeah, does anyone want to pick up on the actual, because I remember that the bodyguard of uh, Malcolm X was kind of interviewed where he kind of gave an overview of how he saw the killers or what, what he saw before their kind of um, conference started. Does anyone want to pick up from that? What kind of happened around that? Yeah, come. Yeah, what, what was the point? Sorry, no, because I think I've built it up to the actual killing because um, mm -hmm. we're talking about what actually triggered that kind of um, that animosity for Malcolm X. So I guess what we've got to at the moment is that a lot of people within the nation of Islam felt like Malcolm X felt like he was too big for himself. A lot of mm -hmm. people felt like he was disrespecting the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And then there were conversations about people, I think, I don't know whether it was one of Malcolm X's son or there was someone that was then asking questions about whether someone could place like a bomb in Malcolm's car. And then obviously this then kind of led to this whole auto bomb kind of incident where they had a conference and then this incident happened. Um, I guess the question I asked was around the whole kind of, if you're able to set the actual kind of scenery where we had the bodyguard of Malcolm X saying what happened when he actually entered the auto bomb and who he saw and then maybe building up as to what happened thereafter, kind of stuff. The, the, the bodyguard, so what, I'm, I'm, I honestly must have missed this part in, in the show. I mean, what did the bodyguard say? Because Actually, now let me just go through it then. So I think yeah. the bodyguard said, um, in regards to the report that he gave, that when they initially walked in, the three people that actually um, carried out the shooting were actually sitting there already. Because what mm -hmm. he mentioned is that normally when people are coming in, they pat them down just to make sure that there's no guns. But those people were sitting there already and they kind of had like some newspaper that they were mm -hmm. reading. So when the conference started, when people were coming in, I think when Malcolm X started speaking, someone shouted something about something about Nigo. I don't know, actually, I'm not sure whether he said the N-word, but someone shouted something. So there was some sort of commotion going on and people turned their attentions to what was going on. And that's when the alleged killer, William yeah. X. Bradley, um, yeah. opened up fire with a shotgun and then the other um killers open up fire with their semi-automatic weapons and okay. then what happened thereafter there was a lot of commotion the bodyguard tried to resuscitate um malcolm x and one of the killers who was tom tom bridge is it tom bridge here? Tom bridge here, yeah tom bridge here, as yeah. he was trying to escape was caught by the mob of crowd outside and he was getting beaten up and that's yeah. when the police kind of stepped in. Um, that's my understanding of this. Perspectives, different views, one, one voice. voice. There, was, there, was five, there was five co conspirators. I guess what I'm saying here is actually the two that were, they were actually arrested um, with um, Tambridge here for the killing of Malcolm X, the two that were actually convicted of the killing. Do you remember? So, oh, Norman X Butler. What's that, sorry? Norman Butler, Norman X Butler, Norman Fixed. 3X Butler. Yeah. 
Um, and I think it's Thomas Griffin. Correct me if I'm Thomas, wrong. Thomas, Thomas 15X. Johnson. 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 Okay. Okay. Are you sure you've not been watching Family Guy, Peter Griffin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Anyway, so so just going back to that then. I think for me, one thing I quite I found quite fascinating is just watching the documentary. We it was kind of um it unraveled that these two actually belong to the New York mosque and they didn't actually commit the murder. Um, especially because Tam Ridge Heyer, who was actually caught with the actual pistol, um, which they found some of the casing um actually fired a shot that ended up killing Malcolm X. And during his actual trial, he did mention that those two people were kind of like innocent. They were not part of it. I found that quite fascinating how even, even though the alleged killers were part of the Nation of Islam, why no one actually came out to actually say that they didn't actually do the killing? So for those two to actually go in jail for 20 years for something that they didn't do, I'm not sure what, what you guys thought about that whole kind of, how that whole thing kind of played out. Yeah, um, for me, from watching the documentary, I think the biggest shock for me was how well known it was who actually killed, who allegedly actually killed um, Malcolm X. And also the fact that they all knew that the other two guys in there, Norman Butler and Thomas Johnson, didn't do it. And maybe I, f I feel the lack of integrity, integrity of that community, all being um, part of the Nation of Islam and following, um, you know, the Muslim Muslim code, that they they continue to allow it to happen. I think that was for me my biggest shock. Kind of. Is is this when when um, religion kind of meets kind of culture in regards to the whole no snitching culture? Is, is that can that be said there? Um, no. Go on. Well, I. I, I, I Go are you gonna go? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go. Gonna go. So for, for me, for me personally, um, that's why when it comes to religion, I don't really, it's a biased kind of situation, but that's another topic that we can go into it. The fact that uh, they all know exactly the, the killer and they just bypass it like that and act like there's, that literally is just normal. I think there's a, there's a, uh, that's what's surrounding. I think there's, there's a fear there. And then within that fear, fear, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of streams within fear. I think that's what the main purpose of it is because if Malcolm X, that allegedly Malcolm X is uh, a well known, a hero, very, very, articulate guy that he know what he's doing if he can be killed by whether it's the religion by islam or whether or not by the fbi or whatsoever if he can be killed who else normal person like myself or back then normal person from any one individual there will be nothing like they won't even talk about them they won't even even address them so i think it's the fear and then the fact that within that period um, people of color, which is the black then, have gone through a lot of torture. So Islamic, for them, was the only hope that they had. And for them not to try to talk about it, they, feel like, they felt like it would be another, another civil right movement or another situation that's going to happen that they're not ready for. I think that's what it is. Is this a fear? I think this is the word I'm going to use as a fear in that. So, yeah, for me, personally. Um, I think for me, I think Abdurrahman, I think in the documentary, he tried to explore that particular avenue. I think he wanted to find out why, um, if, there, if there was evidence to, 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 um, to oppose, you know, the, the evidence that had been put forward at the trial as to why um, Norman X partner and I think it's Thomas um, Mo, correct me if I'm wrong, is it Griffin? Oh, I thought it was it's Johnson, <laughs> isn't it? Thomas Johnson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thomas Johnson. Yeah, Thomas Johnson. Why, um, I think he tried to explore why they'd been um, convicted for it and I think he was always sort of 
met with animosity and people just basically told him to leave it alone. And see, I don't want to speculate because I don't know. I don't know why, you know, these two men were convicted if there was evidence to say that they weren't the shooters. We, you know, we don't know what I did get from the doctor. Within the nation, of Islam, do know, but they just didn't want to explore that topic. They didn't even explain why they didn't want to explore it. Some things were touched on that um, possibly um, FBI may have been involved, but it didn't go into much details to why no one really wanted to touch that topic. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so, just adding to that quickly, I know when he, so you guys vividly remember when he actually found out. So. I guess what you guys are talking about is the state of New York. Um, because these killers, um, they alleged five conspirit con what what did you say? Cons co conspirators or whatever you said more. Um, they all came from the New York mosque, which is where um Tambridge Haya actually came from. And I guess the conversation you guys have had was around what people kind of felt in New York and why there wasn't that kind of the same kind of conversation being had around the, the person actually did it and the whole kind of fear around that. So I know that when he actually found out the name of um, William Bradley, which who was meant to be the alleged killer, um, as Ali Mustafa Shabazz, and then he met one of his, um, the New York activists by the name of Saheed Mohammed, and he asked him, oh, you know what? I've actually found out that this person that I'm trying to look for, that's his name. And the, th the key thing that this person said to him is that leave him alone. He is most probably being protected by the state. And that is interesting because when you find out in regards to what the FBI knew, the FBI actually knew exactly who this person was because on that, on, um, it, during that actual um, conference, I keep calling it a conference, but that speech, there were nine, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there were nine FBI informants there and there were some police informants there as well. And in regards to their description of the person that actually carried out the, the shooting, they described the attributes of um, the Ali Mustafa Shabazz, the alleged killer. Um, so, so it's interesting that even Zahid Mohammed um, was able to say that maybe you need to leave him alone. Maybe the fear was that he was in cahoots with the state in regards to this killing. Maybe that's why people were saying that. I'm not sure what you guys think of that kind of um add one plus one get free kind of um fictional depiction of this what do you guys think do you think that could have been the reason why a lot of people were trying to push him away from it or was it kind of like a directive that was given in the nation of islam for no one to actually talk about it or something what do you guys think i mean it's like speculate on so many different that's reasons that's what i'm saying this is it's all speculation <laughs> at the end of the day yeah. really that's all we're doing um uh, it's gonna be I guess that's my speculation then. My speculation is that uh, maybe some people might have thought that if this person is still walking after killing such an uh, influential person, that there might be more at play here than meets the eye. And maybe that's the reason why some people didn't want him to actually interview that. So actually just moving forward to, to a bit of that. Um, so yeah, we've kind of moved forward to when he found out the name of actual um, William Bradley. And in regards to the co-conspirators, I believe all of them or some of them passed away. So he wasn't able to trace who they were and stuff like that. That's correct, right? Or... Yeah, one of, one of the problems is that there was three other ones. There was Benjamin Thomas, Don Davis, and then another one which he named Wilbur or Kinley. And the problem was is that they all would have changed their names to Muslim names. Um, but then he found out that two of them that had changed their name to Muslim names had died, but he wasn't really sure about the last one, the one that he called Wilbur or Kinley. They didn't really have enough information to find wow. that one. So this person could still be out there. Wow, how, how interesting. Okay, so is there anything that, um, I know we haven't really delved into the whole police involvement and the FBI involvement, is there anything that we kind of need to discuss around that um, before we kind of wrap up? Um, I think my thing, is, again, is more to discuss that the FBI, anyway, was also totally aware of who the killer was. They had his description from their nine informants that they had in the building at the time that Malcolm X was murdered. 
and they had the photo and an ID and um, William X Bradley so they knew exactly who he was but they didn't share any of their information with uh, the police at that time um, and they knew that two other guys were prison sentenced and they they all knew that those two were not the persons that were supposed to be in there. Yeah, that's definitely true. Definitely. Um, it also, I guess, following from that point, well, I guess it, it, it begs the question as to whether there were ulterior motives, well, what ulterior motives were there, especially on the FBI. Um, and even although Abdurrahman did conclude or reach the conclusion that William X. Bradley was the shooter with the sawn off shotgun. Was there anyone pulling the strings behind the scenes that we certainly didn't get to that? We don't know, um, you know, how that particular conspiracy or plan came about and whether there were other people behind the scenes. Yeah, definitely. Good to add to that. So I guess just wrapping it up then, the question I'll ask to every one of you is watching this series, who do you think killed Malcolm X? Oh, I, 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 <laughs> I, I believe. I believe it was William X. Bradley. Based on watching that documentary, I do believe it was him. And no, I'm, I'm not going to say anything more. Does anyone else want to step in? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I believe that um, William X. Bradley, but I also do believe that certain fractions of the Nation of Islam fueled that whole let's kill Malcolm X rhetoric and it was supported by many um, and I think that is what the dangers was really in terms of yes you can dislike someone or hate someone but to actually go and kill them um, I think is more the disgusting kind of element of it and the fact that there were fractions within that group that deeply felt that way um, is what I think is disturbing. Ali? Well, what I think is um, general, generalizing everything, maybe perhaps what I'm going to say is conspiracy, or maybe it's fact, who knows? But analyzing all of that, yeah, William Bradley probably is the one that killed him, but he has support. And that support is like a, a tree that's got a branch that's going around, I mean, just sh stretching out. And that support for me, one of them was at the FBI. The reason why I'm, I, well, the reason why I'm saying um, is the FBI, because the FBI knew Malcolm X was a very powerful man and within his time. And uh, they needed to put him down because he has information that is going to waken the people of color, which is the blacks. And with his power, or with his words, the intelligence that he, what he knows, if he mentioned anything, will, um, will give the, the, the power to more people of color. So they, they saw that coming. They saw that coming. The fact that he has, the FBI, the FBI, the FBI had about nine um, informative within around um, Malcolm X, that, 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 that shows something. And then the other side of it, when I'm mentioning the, the, the analogy of the tree branch, the other part of it is the religion, which is the Islamic. So the Islamic, they had a bit of, power, they had a bit of um, hand into it as well, because the reason why I mentioned that is nothing to do with Honorable Elijah Muhammad. They knew that if they allow Malcolm X to continue what he's doing, first of all, he will take every single people, individual of them, with him. They saw that coming. And obviously, Islamic was very powerful, and he's still powerful now. So Ali, they didn't it's, want it's, that. It's not, it's, Ali, it's not Islamic. It's the Nation of Islam. Islamic the is... Of Islam, the, sorry. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah the, the, the Nation of Islam. So they saw that. They saw that coming. And um, so they don't want any... Obviously, they know what they're getting out of, 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 of being in this religion. They know what they're getting. So they don't want this Malcolm X that is just nobody, nowhere, out of the blue, have all of this power out in the sudden, even more power is going to, if, if they don't get him, get rid of him as soon as possible, he will have more, even for me, for my understanding, the honorable Elijah Muhammad, he will have more power than him. They saw that coming and the FBI saw the other side of him as well. So he was a really a targeted man from both directions. So I don't think that 
yes, William Bradley did have a hand into it, but he had a string of support. And that support was huge. So that's the reason why, from when you generalize in everything, that's the reason why the community of, of the Nation of Islam and the FBI, they had a support with um, um, William Bradley. That's the reason why he, was, he, was, he still existed until recently. You know, that's what I think from generalizing what I've just noticed about the whole situation because the 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 the, the, the power of, of 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 a human being is to have the knowledge and understanding of what you need to do. So I might go off tiny, tiny, slightly topic. It reminds me of even Christ, for example, or even remind me of the greater messiah or greater legend, you know. Every single time when someone wants to stand for the right thing and do the right thing someone always makes sure that that person goes down because why? There's a true agenda of the person showing the true purpose of what is going on, right? So for example, if someone, for example, go for Bill Gates right now, I'm sure that someone within that person, they will be terminated or extinct. That's what it is because they know the true agenda of what um, people are doing behind closed door. And then that's what I think the reason why they got rid of him for me personally. Yeah, so I just just to add to that, and I totally agree with um, some of the stuff that Ali has just said. I think it's a multifaceted kind of um, blame, if I wanted to say it like that. So, for instance, I think I'd like to start from one of the David Garrow. He was interviewed in, on the actual um, series, and he's the expert on F FBI involvement in disrupting black groups in the 60s and the 70s. And one thing that he mentioned is that the most surveillance person in history, or I think at that time or something around that, was um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, because the FBI was were quite fearful of the power that this guy had and what, what he was trying to do in regards to how he was trying to get um, black people to first start businesses and just have more pride within himself. And I thought he brought a lot of pride to black people during that period. Um, I think in relation to um, Malcolm X, Malcolm X became more of a problem for the FBI because he was then moving the religion into politics. And then obviously with the whole, the, the, the idea of how the Nation of Islam were kind of set up, they were set up and they were kind of like, they, they were actually kind of ready to fight for their rights kind of stuff, where they had um, kind of sections within the group where it was more like a regimented kind of like an army kind of stuff you know, learning martial arts and all these kind of stuff as well. And also, um, there was an incident. So I think the other thing I was going to add to that is when Malcolm X was shot and his bodyguard, who was the police informant, was trying to give him mouth to mouth. When he left and he went home and he made a call and he was brought in to be interviewed, they asked him the question, I said, why did you even try to give him mouth to mouth? Which for me is shocking because... Like there is a life, there's someone dying. Why would you not want to give him mouth to mouth? Why would be, even if you're an undercover police officer, why would you like want someone to die? That doesn't make any sense to me. So it's based on some of these things I've just said, hence why I believe that it's a bit more, the blame should be spread a bit more. So I believe that, yes, definitely the FBI, I believe that they worked with the alleged killer in ensuring that A, he was able to commit the murder because there was no police presence. Even from the accounts of their series, they said when the police entered the autobomb, people had like their hands in their pocket. The police were nonchalant. It's like they didn't really care. They were there. It was like they were there to just see a movie or something. And you could see even when they did the interview, when they went down there, they found the stand that he was kind of giving his speech on with bullet holes and everything. What kind of forensics is that? That should be in forensics. So it just shows that there was no, the police didn't have no intention of solving that crime. Um, the FBI had no intention, as we've seen, as they, they, had, they had the record and the person actually committed it. And as Ali mentioned, that you actually have this person walking, living life fine. He was meeting senators. When he died, he kind of got like a proper send off with whole senators going to his funeral. It kind of makes me allude to it that there was more involvement um, in this killing of Malcolm X than kind of meets the eye. So, yeah, that's what I would like to conclude with that. So I guess um, at this point, what I would like to say is thank you for listening to the episode. Thank Hold on, before you go, though, I did want to say one thing. Um, right. I absolutely love the Fruit of Islam, mate. I did not know about them until I watched this documentary. 
Yeah. Trust me. If oh, you're yeah? gonna watch it, the fruit of Islam, they're hard body, mate. Trust me, I like yeah. them. A lot of people a lot of people hide them for their security as well. Um I know Diddy's hide them for security. Um even Johnny Cochran, when he was doing the OJ Simpson trial, he hide them as his security as well around yeah. that time. So, so they're still prominent, they're still running at the moment. Prominent, the of yeah, prominent, a lot of, a lot of prominent black people. But, and even like like if you speak about rap like rappers like Jay Electronica because he's part of the Nation of Islam, he's always talking about the fruit of Islam in his um in his lyrics. I'm not sure if he's part of them, but he's 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 always quoting them and speaking about them, and like you know, just basically how prominent they are within um, their society. Cool. Anything else to add from anyone? No, that's it. Okay. So, yeah, thank you for listening to the LDM Perspective podcast. As I said, this is more of like a community conversation. We want to involve our listeners. So if you do have anything that you want us to discuss, you can reach us on our Instagram handle, LDM Perspective. You can also drop us an email, uh, ldmperspective at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Twitter, uh, I believe. Uh, sorry, Cam, what's the Twitter? Do we have Twitter? at LDM Perspective. Okay, so you can also follow us on Twitter at LDM Perspective. Uh, Thank you for listening and we'll hear from you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Perspectives, different views, one One voice. voice. One voice. One voice.